I'm Alexa Lazochik. I'm a music director, composer, and producer. Music for me is like a best friend. It's there with you. It feeds you when you're hungry. It consoles you if you're sad. Uh, it gives you energy when you need it and you're down. Um, it's with you at all stages of your life, you know, from the nave to the grave. And um, it's, it's a form of energy that we share with each other. And um, there's nothing quite like it. So today we're at uh, Monarch Studios in Vancouver. I am recording with Musica Intima. Uh, they are one of Canada's premier vocal groups. And uh, it's been our utmost pleasure writing for them uh, because they have such beautiful tone to their singing and they work together and we've been able to rehearse and collaborate. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. I, I actually mocked it up, all nine voices, sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses in uh, Sequoia on my own and multi-tracked it, um, just so that they could have a mock-up and work with it and, and get a sense for what they were going to be singing today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to actually directing it and just working with them and, and seeing what kind of sounds we can create together today. So what I'll do often and what we've done on this game um, is looking for a lot of organic textures that are then processed and, um, you know, electronic, you know, we've made them electronic in a sense. Um, so what we'll often do is I'll set up a bunch of mics in the studio, start up Sequoia, just arm a bunch of tracks and then record me maybe on a cello kind of playing, you know, with my bow upside down on a single note and then I'll take that and I'll chop it up and I'll put it through a granulizer and maybe basically do some shifting and then basically that'll be my base drone layer and on top of that then I'll take maybe like I have a hurdy-gurdy at home and I'll take the hurdy-gurdy and I'll you know pitch it to a certain tone and same thing I'll just like whine until I get to a certain thing which is maybe rubbing against the fundamental note of of the cello that I had before and I'll slowly build up a cool texture which in the end the player senses that it feels organic but it's synthesized and that's what you know not just myself a lot of game and film composers are doing um where we we just take organic sources and we kind of like electro uh, acoustic musicians will will deconstruct it and abstract it to become kind of what would have been a pad in the old days they would use you know like some keyboard and play like a supporting pad well nowadays what we do to kind of go to the next step of what's interesting to, to users is we'll, we'll record light bulbs, we'll record vacuums, uh, we'll record whatever to create a tone, an ambient tone, and then we'll bring in a choir or we'll bring in a solo cello or a viola player to play a melody on top of that. And what it does is it kind of, it creates something that's familiar, but at the same time, it's very intriguing. Uh, and that combination of familiarity with something n new or novel um, really gets the player on the ed edge of their seat or at least it makes you know it, it gets them at a visceral level and that's something that you want in entertainment and I would say in any musical expression you want people to engage with the material so we start with organic and then we deconstruct and end up with something that is slightly recognizable. Yeah, it's always been great to record with live um, musicians. There's nothing quite like having real people connect with each other um, and interpret your music in a way and breathe life into it. And video game soundtracks have become a lot more sophisticated over the last decade. Um, and in some cases, I would say on par with Hollywood soundtracks that are even more because we have the whole immersive component and the, the notion of interactivity. So where we used to do MIDI um, and or, you know, programming chips and things, we're able to actually do live recordings um, like I did for Dead Rising 4, where we actually recorded live orchestra in different sections, broke them down into single strokes, chopped them up, and then put them into a game engine. And at runtime, based on what the user did, we were able to trigger a live orchestra kind of playing syncopated, um, atonal music together. So yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty awesome what you can do in video game soundtracks now. Is you're able to you're able to create something really unique with live musicians, but have it deconstructed in a way where you can recompile it at runtime, so the user always hears something different. And I think it's the wave of the future.
for me, it's all about flow. So I, my main instrument is my voice and to be able to improvise in real time. And so I don't want to be encumbered by a slow process or a spinning wheel. Um, I like having access to hundreds of tracks, being able to grab and record my voice to, you know, go, you know, bah, and then be able to quickly chop it up as an object, drop it an octave, drop, push it up an octave, and create like a, you know, da, uh, mm, out of purely just that one take, and that took 10 seconds, you know. And with, with Sample 2 and Sequoia, I'm able to actually reduce that so that when I improvise, I can literally, you know, if I have three hours to write uh, a song or a trailer or I have 10 minutes to write something new, I can't be stuck. And Sequoia and Sample 2 allow me to have creative flow. So I'm able to take my ideas and essentially print them or record them and then that'll inspire something else. So I can use a pitch shifting algorithm to go up or go down. I can add a quick effect on it. Um, but really, I don't have to worry about sound neutrality because the did internal dithering is awesome. And I know that I'm able to have a very quick workflow where the end result is going to always be polished and it's always world class. Yeah, the team at Electronic Arts was awesome to work with. Um, they gave us free reign to explore what it would look like mixing a cinematic palette with an urban hip hop edge to it. Um, and so we used, you know, a lot of 808 type of sounds, a lot of cool things, but we stayed within traditional compositional um, framework. You know, we'd have a, a melody, we would have a strong harmonic bass where you know, if the emotion that we were going for was anger, uh, we would use, you know, just like we would with when we're writing for orchestra. But in this case, we just wanted to give it, you know, some electronic vibes, some, uh, un, you know, we wanted to give it an electronic and urban and hip hop vibe just to make it more palatable to the players who are, you know, enjoyed those elements in the overall licensed soundtracks um, that EA would put in a lot of the FIFA games. Football or soccer is a universal game, and FIFA is loved by tons of fans from different parts of the world. So even when the player would travel, you know, in Volta mode to uh, Rio de Janeiro, or they'd go to the UK or to Japan, we made sure that we incorporated, you know, nuanced elements in the palette um, from those territories to make sure that each section felt unique, but there was like this overall shape of, uh, of an urban hip hop sound that the user would recognize um, as they experienced the journey. You know, I used to play Commodore 64, Rat Race, and a lot of the old school, uh, really simple games. Um, but I myself, uh, I'm not like a huge, huge gamer. Um, but I study gamers and I spend tons of time with gamers. Um, I just find it overwhelming, to be honest with you, to play. So I actually would rather watch other people play and then I get to analyze how they experience the game and what kind of emotions and things that I can do to help make that experience much richer for them. Um, I think writing music for a game, the most important thing is to really understand what, um, what the story is trying to communicate to the gamer because Ultimately, um, you know, music's role is to be a best friend for the gamer during their experience, just like it is for a movie. But I, in games, it's different because it really is you're spending 10 to 40 hours or 100 hours with somebody. And what you write is the soundtrack to their life for that period of time. Um, so for me, it's more important of really understanding what the story is about. Um, what kind of an emotional arc do we want to take the player on? Um, and what do the fans like? You know, I'll, I'll research a lot in terms of understanding. If I'm doing a sequel, I really want to understand what they like from the first one, what they want to hear on the next one. And then, of course, I'll lend my voice to, to that process and try to create something where it's a marriage of, you know, what they've liked, but introducing them to something new. Um, and always trying to work with new people, new instruments, new sounds, um, just trying to make it appealing for everybody that's going to hear it either for the first time or coming back to some, you know, franchise or to a, a, a character that they love. I want to make sure that music is that friend that's going to keep them company and make them feel good during their journey. You never know what doors will open for you. 
um, all that you can do is do the very best you can um, on every project that you commit to. And that means for me, always trying to, you know, aim at a world class level of production, writing, um, but also your interaction with the artists that you work with, the musicians that you work with, and the producers, because ultimately they're the ones who are going to, you know, recommend you to somebody to work on something else. And that's how it worked. I was working on a Disney show called Gabby Duran and the Incitables for Disney TV. And um, Kenny Ortega, the famous director, that creator at High School Musical, um, was just starting his um, new musical for Netflix called Julie and the Phantoms. And uh, his music supervisor, Maureen Crow, reached out to Stephen, senior vice president of music for Disney, and said, hey, we need a music director in Vancouver. Do you got anybody? And because I had worked with Disney and done a good job and followed through to the end, they recommended me. And, and now we've had this amazing honor working with a world-class director. And... You know, not writing music for the show, but music directing. So I, you know, I'd grab my laptop um, and we would get stems from production of all these songs that the band and swing band and marching band were playing in the show. And we'd get to work through and rehearse and teach them how to play different instruments. So it, it's pretty awesome to be able to jump from scoring a show to music directing a show on set to going home and working on a video game and whatnot. And, and the only thing that I focus on is doing my best and really trying to connect with the material and the people that I'm working with. That's the most important thing. So we just finished up our uh, season one for Gabby Duran and the Incitables for uh, Disney TV. Um, it was a great score that they asked me to kind of create uh, a unique hip hop soundtrack um, to support uh, Kylie Cantrell, who's the main uh, artist on the show. She's an amazing hip hop artist herself. So we really created a punchy soundtrack on that to make sure that there was no discrepancy between going from the main title track that, um, that she sang and then going into our underscore during the show. Um, you know, with regards to opportunities um, within gaming or TV or feature film work, I really think it comes down to you, you got to give your very best at all times because you never know who, uh, what opportunity will lead to another opportunity. And the bar of entry for, for anybody within that realm is, is A, be yourself so that you own your own voice because um, there's no point trying to be somebody else. Uh, and B, make sure you're always trying to better yourself and be at a world-class level. Um, in the case of, of Disney, Stephen Vincent, the, the senior vice president of music for Disney TV, um, had a colleague of his, Maureen Crow, who's a famous music supervisor, reach out to him and say, hey, we have Kenny Ortega shooting, you know, Netflix's new big musical, Julie and the Phantoms in Vancouver, and we need a music director. Well, I just finished working on a show with Stephen uh, on Disney, and he's like, you got to talk to Alexa. Probably the biggest difference of writing and producing music for interactive or linear media versus, say, you know, producing a song for an album is that there are a lot more stakeholders involved. So you're not only thinking about um, you're not only thinking about what sounds good to you and what you're inspired to write. You're also thinking of the backstory of uh, you know if it's a main character and. Um, an arc of a story and where the piece of music that you're writing sits within that within that arc, um, that emotional arc. But you're also thinking of you have a viewership, you have a fan base, you have gamers who expect a certain tonality uh, to a franchise or to a game. And, and so to some it might feel like it's restrictive but it's actually very liberating because once you're given boundaries it, you know the rest is you're, it's your it's fair game, you can do whatever you want. And that as a composer or as a producer is very exciting because you know, the more stringent your boundaries are, the more you have to improvise and use and create things out of less things. Um, and so you're forced to simplify your, your melodic language, you're forced to simplify your harmonic language, even your production techniques you're forced to simplify because you know, like the age we live in, there's so much distraction and noise and it's sometimes what what resonates and what speaks to those people is something that is true and pure. 
Um, so we'll often, in games and in films, uh, we'll, because there's dialogue and there's sound effects and there's all kinds of stuff, you really have to figure out how music can contour that experience. Sometimes it has to contour it um, EQ wise, where, where, where you're sitting is like not taking away from the speech uh, level and fricatives and understanding what they're talking about. Other times it's more about em emotion. You want to provide a subtext to what they're seeing on screen. So a character might be saying something or a, a, a character in a game might be doing something, but what you want to provide as music is kind of some waves undulating underneath to give the player a sense that something's not quite right. So whereas in traditional um, music production or writing, you know, you want to write a great song, great melody, great structure, or a great riff or a great hook. Um, we do need that in games and in film and TV, but we also need to keep in mind all the other things and try to package it all up and make it you know, digestible and enjoyable for the end user.